Welcome, Mr. President, welcome again to Friends of Europe. Welcome, Ambassador De Marco. Welcome, dear friends, both in Brussels, at Town Hall Europe, and online. Welcome to you all. First of all, dear Mr. President, or Alex, if your protocol police still allows that uh, today, uh, con congratulations on your election, first of all, as President of Finland. You, you, you obviously know the kind of running joke um, at the time of the pandemic about uh, Finland being the country uh, in the EU that was most happy with the lifting of the uh, social distancing of, of a rule of two meters, uh, because that could go back to the four meters. Uh, you know, so, um, but that's not the experience we have of you. Uh, and that's also what we understand from your uh, blitz visit to Brussels, uh, that you've been running into all kinds of people that you know uh, from before. So it's kind of a, like a rock star arriving in Brussels, it seems. I think in any case that the Finnish people have uh, made a good choice uh, with not only somebody with a, with a great mind, expertise and credentials, but I think also someone who is a skilled communicator. And I think that is in today's world with the war again um, on our continent, which by the way few people I think did expect uh, that we would still experience that in the 21st century in Europe. It's more important than ever that our leaders not only uh, can skillfully navigate the various challenges facing our continent and facing the world, but also interact in a way that inspires, that gives hope and confidence, and which can bring our citizens along. And in that respect, I, I do believe the Finns have made a good choice, and we're grateful that you will address our audience today, outlining your own vision on a reshuffled new era for defense. I think we will all listen with great interest, and I believe we will also do that with great respect, meanwhile, for the resilience of the Ukrainian people. Uh, as friends of Europe also, we wholeheartedly support our Ukrainian uh, friends. And Vasil, thank you, thank you for being with us. Uh, through our Ukraine initiative, uh, which supports communications to leaders and our citizens as to why continued support for Ukraine is essential. And why it is not only a gesture of solidarity or some sort of charity, but an essential part of the defense of our own security, our own prosperity, and ultimately all of our own democracies. And we feel very strongly about that, and it's a point which is not, which is not made systematically enough, I find, as here in Western Europe. And I, I echo that uh, the head of state of um, Belgium, the King Philip, uh, was speaking at the European Parliament earlier today, and he was also saying, and I, I quote him, the fight of Ukraine is our fight. So we count on Finland's leadership uh, when it comes to developing adequate defense policies, when it comes to communicating the importance of ongoing support for Ukraine, and when it comes to the societal resilience, we all need to upgrade, and I think we can be inspired uh, by the Finnish uh, example there, I think. So without further ado, Mr. President, dear Alex, Again, many thanks for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, kind words. And it's, it's indeed very nice to see so many friends in the audience uh, here today. I, I looked at the list and I felt that I knew half of the people in the hall. I, I feel very much at home here in Brussels. We lived here with a family for about 10 years uh, overall. Um, Basically, in terms of speeches, uh, in the next few months, I'll be doing a trilogy uh, of speeches. Uh, one will be on defense, one on security, and one on foreign policy. And, and this one today here is basically on, on defense. Uh, I'll be speaking freely, uh, but I have actually written the speech uh, in an airplane, uh, and I wrote it shorthand. Um, you should actually try it. Do you remember what it's like to write? Like, it, it's actually quite efficient. It took three hours. Of course, then the team has you know, revamped it completely and destroyed it. But you know, the original version <laughs> was, was, was really good. And I, I, do recommend, <laughs> you know, I, I do recommend that you read it. But I, I will be speaking freely. And the way in which I do it is um, I'll, ha I'll have an introduction. And then I will have uh, three points, one on Finland defense, the second one on NATO and defense, and the third one on um, the EU and, and defense. And then I'll make some concluding remarks. But by way of introduction, 
I think all of us know that defense requires planning. And it's always very long term. But I don't think any of us planned for the Russian attack on Ukraine on the 24th of February uh, 2022. I think many of us were caught uh, off guard uh, in a harsh kind of a way. We were not prepared. And I think we should be blatantly honest. Was it not for the heroic fight of the Ukrainians, the Ukrainian army, and President Zelensky, we would have been as weak as we were in 2008, the war in Georgia, or 2014, when uh, Putin and Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula. So in many ways, I think the tipping point of the whole war <coughs> took place, obviously, in Ukraine, but that also set the agenda for all of us. And our memories sometimes are quite short. You know, this <laughs> happened two years ago, and here we are, I have a set of meetings in Brussels yesterday and today, and all I'm talking about is war in Europe, uh, defense, Finnish defense, the EU's defense, and NATO defense. I was in Kyiv last week on Wednesday, and uh, when I left Zelen President Zelensky, we had three hours together, one hour just tete a tete. I told him, that, you're going to win this war, aren't you? And he looked at me and said, Alex, we don't have a choice. But my message to all of you here today is that we have a choice. We have a choice either to help and support Ukraine or then to fall into the oblivion of history and allow Putin to continue his imperial uh, crusade. My, defend, my thesis today is very simple, uh, and that is to say that defense is never binary. So it's not either or. NATO or the EU or national defense. Actually, it's all of the above. So Finland's national defense feeds into the collective defense of our allies in NATO, and both are connected to the defense dimensions of the EU and its overall role. Now, many of you will know me as an EU nerd, but I feel that I'm hard becoming a NATO nerd. And by that, I mean to say that you have to be very careful that you don't put NATO and the EU as some kind of opposites. We, we have a tendency to do that very quickly. The whole debate on strategic autonomy, strategic sovereignty, on, ah, oh, the EU can't do defense, or, ah, the NATO is not capable. Don't think like that. We have to think about it in a much broader sense. So my first point will be on, on Finland and defense. And I see a lot of uh, Finnish friends in the audience, so some of it will be a little bit of repetition for you guys. But the bottom line, I think, is very simple, that during the Cold War, uh, we were neutral, but we were not neutral out of free will. We were neutral out of necessity. We simply had to. A lot of times we had to compromise our values. Why? Because we didn't have the luxury to do otherwise. We were living next to a imperialistic and expansionist neighbor. And just for the record, I'm not talking about Sweden or Norway here. <laughs> so when the Cold War ended, uh, we had a choice. And our first choice was to join the European Union. I'll talk about that uh, in a second. But the political leaders of the time, I think, with the wisdom of hindsight, were right. We were not ready for NATO membership because we would have had to push it into a referendum. And in 1994, I think it was the 16th of October, if I recall correctly, we voted on uh, EU membership uh, in favor, 57-43, and on NATO it would have been a negative uh, vote. And in order to make sure that we stayed secure, um, we had to do two things, really. The first one was to build an international defense corporation to make sure that we would be as interoperable as pos possible and also to be as compatible, compatible to NATO as possible were the day ever to come that uh, we would seek membership. So as a consequence, our military at the time and our politicians did the right decision in purchasing uh, 64 uh, F-18s uh, from the United States. So this made it sure that, yes, we're not in NATO, but we're actually depending on 
uh, American uh, military material. And I think that was a key decision. Along with that was us participating in crisis management operations, for instance, in K4 in Kosovo or in ISAF in Afghanistan. And we did that because we felt that though we were not a part of the alliance, this would be what our military needed to do. The second focus we had outside of NATO membership was not to fall into the oblivion of sort of idealism and thinking that war has ended and history has ended. Instead, we focused very heavily on our national defense. So this meant, among other things, that uh, we had mandatory conscription. I'll just do a test. How many of you have done the Finnish military service in here? See, you know, they're hidden all amongst you. <laughs> so be, be careful. Uh, and, and, you know, that kind of leads, I mean, why did we do it? Because for us, foreign policy is existential. You know, we've had over 30 wars or skirmishes with Russia since the 1300s. We always understood that we had to be prepared. I mean, why would we otherwise have 900,000 men and women gone through military service or 280,000 men and women that we can mobilize at wartime? Why would we otherwise have bought an additional 64 F-35s this time around? Why would we have gone into the secondary uh, military markets in the middle of the Euro crisis to buy military equipment, including tanks uh, and other uh, arms? Why would we otherwise have the biggest artillery in Europe together with Poland? Or why would we otherwise be the only Nordic country with a missile defense system in the air, land uh, and sea? We did it because we knew that there would always be a potential threat. And let me add, it wasn't easy. Because people see it as a zero-sum game. Welfare state versus military state. So to maintain 2%, which we dipped below, I admit, to maintain it long term was never an easy feat. So what would be my reading line here? It is to say that at the same time, our defense was never built uh, in a vacuum. So it was always about interoperability and international cooperation, whether with our Nordic and Baltic friends, the US, the EU or NATO. But the core of it all was our national defense. And this is where I come to my main point on Finland and defense. It is to say that we are currently in the process of changing our mindset from what used to be called, I quote, a credible and independent defense to, and I quote again, a strong defense as part of the alliance. And this might sound as semantics, but it's not. Because this basically means that my message to our armed forces and military establishment is clear. National defense and international cooperation can and must go hand in hand. It is not either or, it is both. And that will be the approach we take in the coming years as we work on integrating our defense within both NATO and the EU. It's not going to happen overnight, but it will happen. My second point today is then about NATO uh, and defense. Um, of course, last week we celebrated the one-year anniversary of our uh, membership in the Alliance, and of course the Alliance itself celebrated its 75th uh, anniversary. And we're very proud to be a member of NATO, and many of you might know that I've been an advocate of Finnish uh, NATO membership most of my uh, adult life. I, I was a bit wild when I was young, so you'll, you'll understand. Uh, but the bottom line here is that uh, it might sound that we are new kids on the block, but to be honest, I think we were NATO members all but Article 5 for the past 30 years. Why? Because we made ourselves compatible. Why? Because we participated in NATO operations. Now, we've joined the alliance in the middle of change, I fully admit that, and we understand that. And we also joined an alliance in the middle of transition. 
And the big thing here is to understand that we have just doubled NATO's border with Russia. And if and when NATO defines Russia as its number one threat, we fully realize that the burden and responsibility that lies on our shoulders is quite big. I might sound a, a little bit unfinished on this, but I would argue because of the size of our military and defense forces, and because of our geographic locations, we are a mid-sized state in NATO rather than uh, a small state. That's at least, I guess, how we <laughs> feel. Now, my bottom line is very simple. We are security providers, not consumers. We give stuff to the Alliance. We are there to protect the Alliance. We have the numbers, we have the know-how, and we have the capacity to do that. And that is about defending our Baltic friends, and it is about defending our Nordic friends. Now, we do what we say. So our defense forces are optimized for fighting in hard conditions in the north. We have a comprehensive security concept to maintain a resilient society, and we also have an advanced technological base. And we try to bring these in to the alliance. Yes, we're only one year old, and the alliance is 75, but we hope that we can give as much help as possible. I also argue that because we come from the geographic margins of Europe, we have to be in the institutional core of the alliance. So our mindset is very similar to the one that we had when we joined the European Union in 1995. We together will be building NATO 3.0. And I know that we're taking the alliance back to its roots as a deterrent uh, against Russia. And as stated in NATO's strategic concept, Russia is the most significant and direct threat to our uh, security. And this should be the focus of everything that we do. And Finland will certainly play its part. Having said all of that, as we approach the NATO summit in Washington in July, it's important that we focus on our main tasks, defense and deterrence. They are and remain the backbone of Article 5, our commitment to collective security. In addition, NATO's deterrence, in my mind, is actually quite straightforward. It is about capability, credibility and communication. And it is based on an appropriate mix of conventional, missile defense and nuclear capabilities, complemented, of course, by space and cyber capabilities. This is what we need to build on. This is for all of us, and this is what we will do together. So the posture is defensive, proportionate, and fully in line with our international commitments. And I just had a meeting with Secretary General, uh, Secretary uh, General Jens Stoltenberg, uh, and uh, told him that he can count on Finland's strong support as we move towards uh, the NATO summit. And one part of this is, of course, what we do with Ukraine. And having discussed the matter with Zelensky in Ukraine last week, I was very clear. Ukraine's place is as a full member of NATO, and progress towards membership is irreversible. That is the message we need to send uh, to Putin and to Russia. Let me then finish off on my third point before I conclude, which is about uh, EU uh, and uh, defense. Now, you have to understand that Finland joined the European Union for security political reasons. Yeah, we talked about the internal market, we talked about competition, and we talked about trade. But to be honest, at the core of things, it was about our security. And of course, it was a value-based decision. Immediately ditched our neutrality, but we were also very constructive. And I remember being uh, a young civil servant negotiating the Amsterdam Treaty and the Nice Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty. We're always focusing on, let's do something on, on crisis management and let's build the defense capabilities of, 
uh, the European Union. Why did we do that? Well, because we understood that we were not members of NATO and we should maximize our security. So the mentality that at least I have personally is that you shouldn't really differentiate between the EU and NATO security providers. They just provide different type of security. And you should really look at them as the same coin, but two different sides. And I actually think it's, it's quite simplistic, a little bit old-fashioned, and sometimes intellectually a little bit lazy to separate the two. I know there's a tendency to do that, especially in Brussels, but also I think in capitals. And a lot of times it's about the identity for the institution that you work with. You know, if you work for NATO, you think that the EU sucks. If you work for the EU, you think that NATO sucks. I mean, it's, it's kind of normal. I mean, it's understandable and quite natural. But I still think that the basic aims of the EU remain the same, the four. So peace, security, stability, and welfare. I just met Ursula von der Leyen. She said in the beginning of her mandate that she wanted a geopolitical commission. She got that, and then some. I actually think that she will go down in history right there with Jacques Delors. And yes, you can say that it was because of circumstance. Well, you have to grab the opportunity. It's not the president that makes the agenda, it's the agenda that makes the president. Who would have believed that it would be the European Union that navigates through COVID? Who would have believed that we're negotiating the 14th sanction package against Russia or that we're using the peace facility as an instrument basically of financing the war? Who would have believed that we're able to freeze uh, the assets of Russia? Who would have believed that we're able to get together so many rounds of support uh, for Ukraine. Someone needed to do it, someone needed to coordinate it, and I think the European Union did a great job. Now, some people, including Mark Leonard, says that we live in an age of unpeace. I agree with Mark. The things that were supposed to bring us together, like trade, interdependence, energy, information technology, can also be used as instruments of war or instruments of power uh, against each other. A lot of people forget that the European Commission has exclusive competence on competition, on trade, uh, and on customs. Those can be used in many ways as tools in today's world. Now, what do I then think that the European Union should do here? I actually think it should use its toolbox as widely as possible. And this doesn't mean that we start having some European armies or troops. But in this war, you have three pillars, national, NATO, and the EU. And the EU is plenty to do. I support many of the initiatives taken by President Emmanuel Macron, as well as other leaders and the Commission. We need to begin using the toolbox more actively in the areas such as financing, industrial policy, space, and cyber defenses. The European defense industry is currently fragmented and inefficient, nationally oriented, and resulting in smaller volumes in different variants. So what we need to do is basically combine purchases, offer financing for defense purposes, leverage technology and industrial policy, and build an EU-wide security of supply. All this builds on the EU's broad toolbox. It's practical and it serves the overall strategy of becoming a more capable and responsible actor and a more credible partner uh, for in, in the rest of the world. So let me then conclude with, well, three points. The first uh, is to say that the process of integration of Finland's defense into NATO is well on its way and we will work to make it happen. Just give us a little bit of time. Um, this means that we will increase our efforts across all domains uh, with our allies in the air, sea and land as well as cyber and space. And we will work with allies to set up a NATO presence and structure in the region best suited for defense purposes. And keep in mind that Finland has doubled again uh, NATO's land border with Russia. So we are a front light state and we will do our part. You will know uh, that we have uh, made a commitment and a wish that we would be under the command of Norfolk. 
uh, but that is a military decision for SECURE to take. Uh, also, we believe that if there needs to be NATO presence on land, Finland is probably the best place suited for that. That is our wish, but the decision is not political, nor is it regional. It should be strictly uh, military. We are also an Arctic country and a Nordic country, and the fact that all Nordic countries are now in, now in NATO brings a new level of cohesion, I would argue, uh, to the defense of the Nordic region. My second point, Finland does not differentiate between NATO and the EU. We understand that the organizations differ and their tasks are different, but they also complement each other in various ways. Uh, so strategic autonomy is a worthy goal for Europe, especially uh, if it means that we increase our commitments to defense. But we must, uh, must be achieved by cooperating with our partners, including the United States. The bilateral relationship between Finland and the US will remain essential. We are European, but at the same time transatlantic. They are not mutually exclusive, quite the contrary. Uh, my final and third point is that we will be a reliable partner uh, in the EU. So it means that we will do our part. We will keep our commitment uh, outlined in Article 3 of the Washington Treaty, which includes exceeding 2% of GDP in defense exp expenditure. And we do that as much for ourselves as our al allies in NATO and our partners in the EU. And my final remarks are these. In the end, this is about driving change of mindset throughout Europe. Defense is not something that only the states bordering Russia should care about. We are all threatened and we are all affected. We must foster a strategic culture mindful of the fact that everything starts with people. We have to ensure that our populations have the will to defend their country and creed. To do that, we must make sure that our countries, our democracies, and our ideals are worth fighting for. And I will leave you with a thought of 80, 90, 90. That is to say that in Finland, 80% of the population is willing to defend the country. That is more than in, other, in any other European state and one of the highest in the world. Secondly, 90% of the population is in favor of NATO membership. And thirdly, 90% of the population is willing to send Finnish soldiers to NATO operations. So worry not, we will do our part. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Damendra Kanani, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Spokesperson, privilege of moderating this conversation with the newly elected president. A very um, a powerful speech, one of a trilogy. We look forward to um, version second, the second and third, uh, but you've made a really quite a profound... Do you want, do you want to host them? No, no, yeah, yeah, we do, we do, we do. Uh, absolutely, let's make it an annual thing. If you're going to do it six months a year, well, we can do that. Um, You've covered a lot of ground. You, you ended with people. Let me start with people. Um, we've, most people may not know in this audience, but we've recently established a democracy lab and we canvassed or engaged in the discussion with two, 2,024 citizens across seven markets in Europe. And we asked them about security and defence. And they're more worried about um, climate-related a disaster than armed conflict. They are more concerned to make sure that NATO is the alliance they rely on because they feel the EU won't actually build an EU army. And thirdly, they feel that where security matters most is national, because they, the national governments have the power and should be doing more, but have very little faith in the leadership. So that's from 2024 citizens uh, canvassed across Europe, um, as I said, from very significant markets uh, across, across, across the territory. My question to you is, you've been meeting a lot of people recently. You've done a you know, show-stopping tour with mm. these, all these characters. What's your sense of the zeitgeist on defence in particular from speaking to these various in individuals? And you make a lot of reference to learning from the past but looking ahead. What's your sense of having met some of the most senior characters and actors in the field? What's the zeitgeist of defence at the moment? 
Well, I think, you know, I have to split it into two. The first is to say that, of course, during the campaign, you get a sense of what's really going on because you meet hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of, of people. And, and I think the campaign in Finland, in, in many ways, it was quite reassuring. Mm-hmm. Finns understand defense. Finns understand security. Why? Because the looming threat of Russia has always been there. So part of our identity is to make sure that, you know, our defense remains strong. So the debate, I think, was a lot about NATO, about Russia, about Russian threat, mm-hmm. about supporting uh, Ukraine. And I guess the issue of climate change sort of fell a little bit ajar. In mm-hmm. a I mean, we, we didn't have that debate as strong. It'll come back, there's no question about it, because it's existential, like, like any uh, big issue. But in Finland, there was a number. The second one is... It depends a little bit who you talk to. So the closer you are to the Russian border, the more our identity is about security and defense. The further you go, it might start becoming about migration or might start becoming uh, about the economy or it might start becoming becoming about climate change. But what I found so startling in this, this whole sort of crisis was that you know, I mentioned I was an, an EU nerd, so I've been doing this stuff for 30 years, and we always complained about, oh, the EU is not unified, and oh, mm. there are different voices. Yeah, of course they are. We're 27 member states, so, you know, we're not a utopia. But my argument is I've never seen the European Union so united as we have been in, in, in the past two years. Now, of course, it's not a lasting state. Nothing is lasting. But, but, but I still think that the sense that I get is that there's still strong, strong support for Ukraine, but I just don't know how long that is going to last. I guess my takeaway is to say that Europe is now fairly permanently divided into two. Mm. We have Russia and Belarus on one side providing the threat, uh, and then we have about 40, more or less, European states on the other side of the fence. And it's very important that you know, we work towards the, the same goal uh, but there'll be a lot of convincing that we need to do in the next few months and certainly as we start moving towards the European elections. Indeed. What about the actual characters and actors that are heads of organisations? You've met with von der Leyen, you've met with you know, Jens Stoltenberg, etc. And you were in the parliament this morning as well. Yeah. What's your sense of that political zeitgeist for defence? Because we've seen the kind of jarring, the movements, the kind of the dancing on the stage, if you like, depending on what the focus group says or what the latest crisis is. What's your oh. sense of it? I, I, you know, my sense, I, I've obviously I've had the opportunity. The nice thing is when you enter office, people actually want to take your calls. So, yes, indeed. So, you know, I've, I've talked to uh, pretty much everyone. So if I start from my Nordic colleagues and Baltic colleagues that I've talked about, talked with, sense of urgency, full understanding, no question about it. I've spoken to the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, full understanding, you know, good an analysis of the situation. I have obviously uh, met um, uh, President Zelensky. I've spoken to the secretary general of, of the UN. I've spoken to the secretary general of NATO and now met him actually uh, twice since I was elected. And I've now met Ursula von der Leyen as well for a second or third time. And I, I spent some time in the Munich Security Council. So there is this sense that something needs to be done. Mm-hmm. And I think in the big analysis, we could say that the window of opportunity for Putin is from pretty much now to say end of August, early September. This is the sense that I get. And during that time, he might launch a counteroffensive of sorts. The thing that keeps me awake at night is that Putin and Russia are so cynical that human life does not matter. Mm-hmm. And that means that he has resources, military resources, for two years. And that combined um, with unlimited human resources is, is the part that, that worries me. There are, of course, pieces that need to be put together. I support the Czech initiative. I think that's great. I support the ideas that uh, the Secretary General of NATO has for creating a package uh, as we move toward uh, the Washington summit of NATO in, in July, I would urge the American Congress uh, to pass the 60 billion US dollar package. And once we start putting all of these streams together, it falls into a big river, and then I think uh, we'll manage. Uh, I come back to the notion that, you know, Zelensky and Ukraine does not have a choice, mm. but we have a choice to help or not. 
And I think we need to fall in the help cap. Okay, great. Colleagues, I, I will bring you all in, so start preparing your question. And I just urge you, no speeches or commentary. A question was great, because there's lots of you here. So take the opportunity of being in this room with him to ask, you know, your most pressing or interesting question that you'd like an answer from. So before I do, just one more. Conscription. Hmm. Staying with the theme of people. Yeah. Just to, how many of you in this room, if you're prepared to put up your hand, how many of you in this room would support con mandatory conscription across... Europe, as we know it. Hands well, I up. Can't, yes. I mean... <laughs> Bit of a waiver here. It's yeah. not totally 50%, but it's more than I thought yeah. there would be. Yeah. What's your view on that? Kind of, would that be something which you want to promote um, as a policy initiative? I mean, obviously, I can't do it Europe-wide, but I can say, like, because we're you know, very strict constitutionalists, I, I think that all NATO countries should have conscription. I can say that, but I can't say that all <laughs> EU countries. Indeed, I know you no, can't. Yeah, but, yeah. It, OK, so th where do I come from? Does this mean that, you know, I'm a military hawk who believes that the only way in which you can stave off things is through mandatory conscription for men or a combination? No, that's not my point. My point is that... Actually, conscription can be one of the best glues of modern society. I mean, you know, I was uh, in the military service. I served only eight months because I had to go to the U.S. to study with people whom I would never have met otherwise, from all kinds of different locations, with all kinds of accents, with all kinds of backgrounds. You know what the coolest thing is? I still bump into these guys 30, 40 years later. How are you doing? Where, even during the campaign, I met three guys out of our cabin of eight. And it's not so much about the ethical or moral issues about doing a military service. It's really about societal glue. Mm. It's kind of the best welfare things that you can do, but we always see the sort of face of a soldier in a uniform. That's not what it's about. Mm. It's about going there, learning a new skill. Now, my son is doing his military service currently. And, uh, you know, so I talk to him a lot. I, I get sort of the feeling on the ground. And it's completely different from what I did in 1988 to 1989. They do super interesting stuff because it's more technologically savvy, uh, because of the equipment that they have, probably because of the resources that they have. They learn a lot of leadership skills. They learn a lot of skills about themselves. It's a good way of connecting the mind and the body. At the same time, he comes and says, listen, dad, there's some ethical issues with this. I'm being trained to kill. This, you know, it's a philosophical question. And then you have a conversation about that. At the same time, he says, you know, are you sure that the system whereby you kind of dropped off top down with the ranking based on the ability that you have in the service is a good thing mentally for everyone? Or should there be some different types of support? So all I'm trying to say is that don't think about conscription only as a military exercise. It's actually a societal exercise. Now, can I now suggest to everyone, you should have conscription? Well, I kind of want to, but I realize that not everyone necessarily needs it. And I also realize that to make that suggestion right now, everywhere, could be a little bit complicated. We've grown into the system. Mm, indeed. And, and that's why we approve it. In Finland, we actually now have a conversation, rightly so, uh, should women be part of conscription? And if not immediately, what should the system be? So, you know, it, it's a super interesting question, but put it this way, I am glad that Finland had mandatory conscription even when the Cold War ended. No, and you make the, you make the point in your speech about the fact that, you know, essential to Ukraine was to have that uh, capability uh, within, 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 the, within the population, and that's what you you know, have commented on yourself for what, should there be a, a situation, uh, heaven forbid, uh, in the Finnish context that you'd be ready, uh, given what you've invested in. Colleagues, um, questions, right? Why is it it's always the men that put their hands up first? No, Women, please. Not, not. Ah, we have one there. I'll come to you in a, I'll come to you in a moment because I want to do justice to the men who put their hands first. So, so there's gentlemen there, gentlemen there, and gentlemen there. Introduce yourself, please. The mic is on its way. And as I said, I pray upon you, no long speeches. A question was great. 
Introduce yourself. Dmitry Shkurgo, National News Agency of Ukraine. Uh, Mr. President, thank you so much for a huge assistance your country provided to Ukraine. And now my question. Uh, after you visiting Kiev uh, in uh, the beginning of April, Finland became one of the eight countries which concluded the security arrangement uh, with Ukraine. Uh, it's for 10 years. It's quite a long period. So that what is your vision? What will be the role of Ukraine playing in the European security after, of course, our victory uh, okay. in this war? Great. Thank you very much. It's only one question. I'm sorry. Gentlemen here. Third row. Glasses here. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Terry Stamatopoulos. Among other things, I'm a former NATO Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs and Security uh, Policy when we started uh, um, interoperability <clears throat> and the enhanced operational partners to include Sweden and Finland. Uh, my question, the first leg of which everybody's probably itch itching to ask, there will be elections in the United States. But I'll go to the other part. There are elections upcoming also uh, in Europe. Mm. And the European electorate seems to be veering to the right, uh, to the right of what we call Christian Democrats or the EPP and so on and so forth. And uh, the understanding is, the analysis is that part of this electorate uh, wants to renationalize defense, so less cooperation, perhaps even in a EU, uh, EU context, but also is less reluctant to criticize Russia, to put it. So what is uh, your opinion on how these two electoral processes and results could affect uh, defense since this is the main topic of your discussion Okay, today. that's a very big question, but we'll, let's, let's see what Alexandra does with that. Um, gentleman there with the glasses. Uh, um, there's a mic behind you. Sorry. Sorry. Mr. President, my, my name is Uwe Mergen. I'm a former naval, naval cap captain working in EU and in NATO. Uh, my question is, you talked about um, the situation. And uh, what is your position on the nuclear thing, as it was here already discussed? Okay. Great. And I won't finish without taking you, obviously. Come on. Hello, Mr. President. Thank, uh, good to meet you in person. Uh, I'm Alice Stolmeyer, the founder of Defend Democracy. My question is, uh, I read that Finland is preparing a proposal for a so-called uh, preparedness union. Is there something you, more you can share about okay. that? Is it about societal resilience, uh, also against hybrid threats? Um, is there anything you can share? Thanks. Okay. Sure. Great. Okay, yeah, thanks. I think four, four very good, mm -hmm. good questions. Uh, the, the, the first question was Ukraine's role for European security and the fact that we had just signed the eight countries signed a security agreement with Ukraine. On the security agreement, I think the starting point is very simple. What we want to do is to establish the 32 security agreements to a certain extent as pathways to both EU membership and NATO membership. So on one hand, we need to give the short-term uh, aid and help military and financial and material uh, and institutional to Ukraine. On the other hand, we need to make sure that Putin understands that Ukraine will never be Russian. Ukraine is European forever. And that is the role of uh, Ukraine in terms of uh, European security. So my take is that the decision was taken uh, by the European Council in December on giving candidate status for Ukraine was the right one. Now people understand Ukraine will become a member of the European Union. Enlargement is not anymore only a legal technical exercise, it is a geopolitical uh, strategic goal. And the same goes for NATO. So this is the reason we do the security agreements. And that's why, of course, Ukraine is going to be one of the key elements of European security is already now and will be uh, in the future. Uh, US elections, I won't comment on. But can I just throw out one idea? A lot of people are saying, what if Trump is elected? But can you also think a little bit the other way? Isn't the holding up of the US $60 billion aid package an example of 
what if Trump is elected? So we're already now seeing a policy which is a little bit complicated. So keep that in your mm-hmm. mind. That, that, that is a framework that we are, we're working with right now. On the European elections and having ran uh, together with Ville Itala uh, for the European Parliament in 2004, there is always this fear that, you know, there's going to be extreme right or extreme left. And it, it's a justifiable fear. But I think all of Europe has, to be very honest, moved quite a lot to the right. One reason is migration. A second reason is the war. A lot of the values that we're talking about right now are quite hard values. I want to go beyond that. You know, I I always look for centrist uh, politics. I still think there isn't that much space to be a Russia appeaser right now. And we have to keep that in mind. And why? Because I think the balance of power in Europe has shifted eastbound. Countries like Poland are right now super important for the European Union. What Poland says, people listen. So my hope, of course, is that people will go, and ele- will go to the elections, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Final point. I think it's great that you know, we have most so-called democratic elections in the history of the world today. But I sometimes think it's a little bit odd that we really worry about elections in the sense that, hey, that's what democracy is about. We have a lot of elections. I remember people say, oh, four big states have elections in the European Union this year. Yep, it's democracy. So I'm really excited, actually, about the European elections, albeit I'm not, you know, a candidate myself. And, of course, having talked to Roberta Metzola today, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, Charles Michel, uh, you can really feel the buzz of European elections. And isn't that what Brussels should, to a certain extent, be all about? I mean, we always complain that it's not democratic enough, it's not political enough. Well, this is what it is. Um, so, you know, we'll see. Will it have an effect on defense? I don't think so. I think we're very much in the mood and mode of we're going to continue defense expenditure. And there, by the way, Trump has been on the right side of history on this. He has pushed NATO allies to increase expenditure to 2%. And this will, I think, continue. Um, the nuclear thing. <laughs> what do you mean by the nuclear thing? Uh, that's the first question. Huh? Ah, okay, okay, okay. Because, I mean, the nuclear thing can be so many things. First of all, on nuclear threats coming from Russia and from Putin, uh, they did not continue. And the reason for that is that the Global South and China said, enough is enough. With nuclear, I think the best thing you can do is not to talk about it, but have have it uh, as a deterrence. That is what the American nuclear umbrella is about. That is about what the French uh, nuclear uh, umbrella uh, is about. And I think the key right now is for the NATO allies to continue nuclear panning, as they have always done. Um, I don't belong to the category of pessimists who thinks that we are moving in that direction. But unfortunately, the notion of a nuclear deterrence uh, is back, whether American, whether British, uh, or uh, whether French. The big worry I have, of course, is that a lot of the original nuclear agreements that we had don't hold anymore. Exactly. Uh, and that's my big worry. And then there was, Alice, your question about the preparedness union. Yes, it is actually a Finnish initiative. What can I tell you about it? Two things. We do that already. So we have what is called you know, security of, of supply. So we have authorities that work together across mandates, the border guards, the military, the police, the secret police, and then the center of the security of supply, who make sure that in a crisis situation, we have enough stocks, we do the right things at the right time. We do a lot of exercises based on this. That's the first part. Second, I think that is one of the reasons that my predecessor, President Sauli Niinistö, has been asked to do a report along those lines of a preparedness uh, union. I like the concept of lot because, again, it comes to the notion that being prepared is not only about military, 
being prepared is also about civilian resilience. And that in our security thinking actually has more or less 17 different pillars. I won't go into all of them, but this means that Europe needs to prepare. What happens if electricity is cut off? Mm. What happens if you don't get water? What happens if data cables are cut off? And we need to be prepared for these kinds of situations. Absolutely. Thank you for making that point, because on the um, preparedness point, we've, we've run a number of tabletop exercises. We've been kind of amazed that you know, 70% of infrastructure is owned by the private sector, yet they're very rarely brought into preparedness well, work. Th this is, yeah. No, this is the thing. I mean, so we do the opposite. So our security supply center, CEO Janne Kankanen, he has a deal with the private sector. Mm -hmm. Our security of food supply is 80%. I don't know if anyone else has that, but we have it. Because he has a deal with farmers, that you provide this grain, you provide that grain, you provide that milk. He has a deal with the energy suppliers. If we run out of diesel, if we run out of petrol, if we run out of kerosene, you are the one who's providing it. And these are agreements. I don't even remember how many companies he has agreements with, but we're talking you know, north of 200. Uh, and that's what we need to do. Okay, great. I know there's two or three hands already up. Your point about democracy, whilst I absolutely agree with you that we should be excited, you know as well as everyone in this room, this is the first time in history where our, di our democracy will may possibly be determined by AI and bots mm. that will affect yes. behaviour. And we mustn't shy away from the reality of that because the ordinary citizen out there that's not literate in AI um, has every capacity and potential to be influenced in the wrong way. Sort of question, yeah. it's just a yeah. comment that good, we good, good. mustn't lose sight of that because it will be the first time I think there will be a... It will be a festival of disinformation and misinformation. Yep. Um, lady there, yourself, please. Hi. Um, yeah. oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Terry Schultz. Um, a finophile and, <laughs> and a reporter for NPR and Deutsche Welle. So I wanted to go back on something that uh, was brought up at NATO while you were just there, and that is um, Ukraine's right to use weapons mm. to strike whatever targets it likes. This is a debate right now in the United States. I'd like to know what you make of that debate, of the United States uh, criticizing some of the targets Ukraine has chosen, uh, because Defense Minister Hakkinen has said Finland has no problem with Ukraine using the weapons provided to it by Finland to strike mm. anywhere it wants, including inside Russia. Thanks. I always Great. agree with my Lovely. defense minister. Um, I'm going to privilege people at the back, if you don't mind, um, because the gentleman there with the glasses and the, and the orange tie, and yourself, obviously, and then I'll come back to some of the people here. Again, be, be very brief, please. Sure. Bart Shevchuk at Covington and Berling. What is your take on the debate over seizing Russian state assets? There's about, about $200 billion worth here okay. in Brussels at Euroclear. The international legal grounds are pretty clear that you can seize these assets on the basis of countermeasures. In other words, if Russia violates international law, you can engage in actions to get its troops out of Ukraine and to help defend Ukraine. Um, there's still some resistance in Berlin, Paris, and, and Rome. But what, what have been your sort of interactions with... What's your leaders? view on frozen assets, uh, seized, uh, seized assets? Would you use them for public good and therefore arm Ukraine with those? You could use them to arm Ukraine, okay. uh, reconstruct Ukraine, uh, provide for uh, Great. private claimants. Well, we we're going to have a conversation about that next month, actually. So count us in. There you. Yes. Hi, Emilia Castro with the UN. Um, President, you mentioned that Finland doesn't differentiate between, um, between NATO and the EU. But is it realistic to be able to finance both, especially now you know, with the potential creation of a DG defense as announced by uh, President von der Leyen if uh, she gets re-elected? Thank you. Thank you. And just here, gentlemen, one of our colleagues here, again, introduce yourself very brief. Then I'll ask you to respond to some of those. Then we'll go back for a final round if we have time. Yeah. Uh, hello, Mr. President. I'm a private I'm a venture capitalist, so I'm totally independent. Um, very ahead <laughs> in technology. It's a really good framing there, Peter. Absolutely. It's a very good you framing. You know me, that I, do, man, I right? do know me. It means, uh, so, independent from the financial markets? <laughs> exactly. Or? You know? Independent from the financial markets. Absolutely, because we're not listed and it's our own private money. We're only two investors. So we have developed a very, very um, a revolutionary technology in California. So I'm not going to go into this. You mentioned, and actually discussion was on four things. The first is obviously use of nuclear weapons, utilities, uh, so non-conventional war which is cyber attacks, which is water, gas, information, disinformation because of elections. Just want to simply point one thing. There is something even more insidious and more dangerous than nuclear weapons or you know, military threat. 
is artificial intelligence. And the reason why that is so important, and particularly why Europe is losing sovereignty, is because we do not have a European cloud. And remember that the base of artificial intelligence is billions and billions of data. European citizens, our data are in the hands of the Americans with the GAFA, and in the hands of the Chinese with the BATX. We have no European cloud. Okay. Last point, Gaia, it was a, an initiative of Europe. What we've done immediately is to invite Google and the Chinese. I think it's a major mistake because data will be fundamental in 10 years. AI will dominate, and that's a major problem. Okay. Thank you. Um, if we get time, we'll do another round very quickly. Okay, very good. First question came from um, Terry on, on whether we think it's okay that Ukraine uses certain targets in Russia. Mm. Where was Terry? I'm over here. There you go. Mm. Um, well, the way in which I framed it in, mm. um, in Kyiv, and I'll, I'll frame it the same way, is we of course don't know who has hit the oil refineries, but the price mm. of oil is not my primary concern right now the price of saving lives of Ukrainians is. And I think it's very important that, you know, we are steadfast and honest to ourselves. We're not giving uh, Ukraine weapons, ammunition, uh, military mechanisms for them to be hugged. Uh, they are used for something. And of course, I stand by my defense minister on this particular. We have no illusions about, you know, what they're used for. Uh, that's also why we uh, give them. I actually think that Europeans should work a lot on drones and helping Ukraine with, with, uh, with those. War is cynical, uh, as we can see. Second, uh, Russian state assets. Um, I think, if I recall correctly, Euroclear has about 190 billion uh, here. Um, and I discussed the matter actually yesterday with Prime Minister Alexander de the crew here. Um, you know, I would like to say that, you know, you stole, use all the free assets immediately and give them to the Ukrainians, but it's probably a little bit more complicated than that. But I think what the European Union should work towards right now is to find a system which is legally sound mm. in the long term, which gives the possibility of using windfall taxes mm. or investing the frozen funds into something and therefore creating a money generator which could be used not only to finance the war but also for reconstruction. But I think I would be a little bit careful in, you know, giving all of the assets immediately. So do some careful planning on that. Um, but be a little bit brave as, as well. It's, it's quite complicated. Um, financing the EU and NATO, I, where did that question come from? Yes, um, I mean, obviously I don't see this as an accounting exercise, and of course you can't really compare them, because the European Union budget is a little bit over 1% of uh, GDP, and it is targeted in different ways, and is actually collected in a different kind of a, a way. Whereas I think our NATO membership is, what, 430, 40, 50 million euros per annum? Do, you, do our guys remember? Huh? Hmm? Commonly funded in general. So our share of it is, is actually quite limited. And, and I would argue that from NATO, we get quite a lot of bang for our buck, as they say. Uh, so uh, I, 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 don't, you know, I don't think we should really you know, compare the two because the, the aim is completely different, uh, the use is completely different. So I think when we talk about finance on the NATO side, I think the key is that uh, member states stick to Article 3 to make sure that they use 2% of their GDP on, on defense. And then collectively we look at uh, how we can, we, can, we can use it. We, we, don't see, um, we don't see NATO as an expense. Quite the contrary, we put it on the plus side. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to quickly, just three more uh, questions, very briefly. Sorry, very there briefly. was a question on AI. There was actually, yeah, yes. From yeah, I, I do apologize. Okay. I, I agree with you that, you know, artificial intelligence, 
robotization. It changes the economy, the way in which we work. It changes politics and the way in which we communicate. It changes war and the way in which we conduct it. And actually it changes science and potentially the way in which we are as human beings. Mm. There are a lot of good books on data. Uh, Privacy is Power is one of them, written by Felisa Caris, if I recall correctly. There's a really good one written by um, Anu Bradford, uh, Digital Empires. I'm not being domestic about this. She's Finnish. She's at Columbia. Um, my big take on this is that, I'll simplify it. You have three ways of managing data. One is China, where data is quite centralized. Uh, and quite state-based. The other one is the United States, where it's basically outsourced to the private sector. We give consent by every time pressing, I agree to what I do not know, but nevertheless, I agree with it. Indeed. And the third one is Europe, where data is in the private domain. My take is that it probably needs to be a mix between the three in one way or another, because data can also be a common good. Now, whether we then open a side of threat by not having our own cloud, my competence doesn't go that far. But I think when you look now at actually the five domains of defense, they are land, air, sea, cyber, and space. And we need to really, and that's why I said one of my points, we need to work on the technological assets and competence that we have in, in Europe on this. Because I do firmly believe, like you said, uh, the big fight is going to be on, on uh, AI. Uh, <laughs> the big difference is it's really difficult to have a grasp of what's going on. When I started writing a book three years ago, it was called Digital Democracy or Digital Dictatorship. Uh, now I've just reduced it to basically one chapter on technology and moved it to global politics. But uh. Exactly. <laughs> Indeed. So you've been very patient, sir. I'll, but again, very brief. I'll only take two or three more. And I'm going to privilege... Well, I, there are no women's hands up. So, OK. Uh, try again. But, sir. Vladimir Zanko. <clears throat> I am from Mission Africa into NATO. I am following your advice and uh, remembered how to write. <laughs> So my, uh, I want to come back to your last visit to Kyiv and ask you, how do you assess the probability and expediency of deploying limited... How do I assess what? Expediency of deploying limited military contingent of Finnish armed forces in Ukraine to provide... Those boots on the ground. Yes, not, to provide okay. not combat operation missions, <laughs> like protect the border, uh, training and others. Okay, great. Thank you. Gentleman right at the back with the glasses. You can get up so you can, people know where you are. No, no, wait for the mic, please. And last but not least, I'll take yourself. That'll be it. Thank you very much. I'm Oliver Droite, European Commission. President Stupp, I have a question. You spoke a lot about credibility. We're looking for credible budget, for credible means. But does a credible defence policy also require a credible foreign policy? We saw that support for Ukraine is difficult to garner on a uh, uh, world level. And with the events in Gaza, we had big difficulties in internal coordination. So for a credible defense policy, do we need a credible foreign policy? But also, if you if recall what uh, uh, Alexander said in his speech, um, given the portfolios he's run, I thought it was quite, sh it was quite welcoming and really in innovative on your part to say, sometimes we need to rethink the nexus of trade investment, foreign policy and defence, and make it much more uh, holistic, which I think it's, it's a great thing that you're promoting. Gentlemen here. My name is Jan Tutsa, I am the Council in the College of Europe. Um, I, when I was in military service, the president of Finland was uh, President Kekkonen. Okay. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, he, he finished said, his mandate around 1981, just so you get it. <laughs> he started it in 1956. He said, uh, I remember very well, that uh, with Russia, our relations is special, and the diplomatic channels for dialogue should be always kept under all circumstances opened. Um, one can put the question that uh, 
whether this can be also a message for today. Or the alternative is that Russia can be defeated in this war. And uh, therefore, the right policy ahead is uh, the escalation of the conflict. So that is really a question which should be also addressed, because there are member states in the European Union who already raised this as a policy. So my question is whether this Kekkonen policy in the 21st century, certainly in quotation mark, is still not a, a warning that diplomacy should be always kept open to the diplomatic mm. channels, even if we all agree uh, what you have said. And thank you for your presentation, Ozot. Thank you. Good. OK, uh, so three questions. I guess, you know, if the first question was, will Finland provide boots on the ground in Ukraine? The answer is, I hate to disappoint you. No, we will not. Uh, we will try to help by all means uh, possible, but uh, we have ruled out uh, this idea. There's, of course, this element, the discussion about strategic ambiguity, but on, on this one, I think uh, we're quite clear. Um, Second, uh, Oliver Droite on, on, on the credibility that can you have a credible defense if you don't have a credible foreign policy coordination. I think this is one of the sort of main problems that we have in the whole discourse about European foreign policy. We, we have to understand that what we're trying to do is to coordinate 27 European foreign policies. Mm -hmm. And that means that you know, we have a whole bunch of historical luggage, baggage, uh, and culture and views. You know, France and Germany have different views on Israel. You know, the uh, say Belgium and Spain have different views uh, in Africa. Mm. Uh, and what we're trying to do is, is bring these together. And quite often it is about you know doing the lowest common denominator. The two key examples I think from the last two three years. One is Ukraine. I do think that we have actually been amazingly united on that, whether on sanctions. Uh, whether on the peace facility, um, whether on uh, you know Ukrainian uh, EU uh, membership, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why? Because we have an external threat, and we believe that what Putin did was wrong. Where we as united after uh, Russia attacked Georgia in 2008 or annexed the Crimean Peninsula in 2014? No, but the tipping point was a blatant attempt to attack, overtake. Uh, Kiev and kill Ukrainian identity. And that was, you know, the, the, that was the sort of the basta moment. Now, have we been united on uh, Israel, uh, Palestine? No, because there is historical differences. And this is what makes European foreign policy quite complicated. Mm -hmm. And that's why I do think that being high rep of the EU is almost mission impossible because he or she is not given the institutions to, to, to act. Uh, and that's why I hope that, of course, whoever the European Council chooses as the next high representative will be given a stronger mandate. But remember, I come back to the point that Europe advances step by step. Integration in one area leads to pressure to integrate another one. And usually it happens through crisis. So we're moving in that direction. But let's, let's just start from the premise that the European Union is never perfect. And then it's much easier. The EU always advances in three phases, right? First, there's a crisis. Second, there's chaos. And third, you get a suboptimal solution. <laughs> you know, that's how it goes. <laughs> and live with it. <laughs> you know? uh, so can foreign policy we combine with a credible defense policy? Yeah, I think it can. And I, I think it actually has. Um, then um, I, I, I have a probably a policy of not commenting as, as the 13th president of the republic uh, on the work of my predecessors. Mm. But I think, you know, presidents always are prisoners of their time. And what President Kekkonen wanted to do from 1956 onwards, remember after the Winter War and the War of Continuation, was to preserve Finland's existence, Finland's identity and Finland's culture. And what he probably had to do was to compromise many of the values that we believed in. Why? Simply so that we could exist. And I think he did it successfully. But would I 
import get the Kekkonen policy into 2024? The answer is no. <laughs> I, I, I would not. Uh, that is not the way in which you deal with Russia. The only thing that Russia understands is, is power. Uh, does this mean that we have no diplomacy or open lines? No. At some stage, there will be time for dialogue. But I think for me, at least as president of Finland, that dialogue has to come from a mandate from our allies. We still continue our relations with practical issues such as the border or with our diplomats. But on the political level, we do not have a relationship at the moment. Uh, we live in different times. Of, of, in, in, in different times. On that note, s- deterrence, you make reference to that and you made reference to the part of your vision in your speech, and I'll end on this note, is a much more of an integrated, integrated, integrated EU-NATO. You know as well as everybody else that deterrence is as much a psychological framing as it is about in- institutional yeah. infrastructure. What are you going to do to, or how can you make sure that we get beyond the kind of the battles and the kind of the, the dilemmas, the dichotomies of not, the, not about the spend, but about a different mindset that sees integration as the core of our future defense policy? I think a lot of it actually comes from Brussels. <laughs> And, you know, our military staff and our civil servants uh, coordinating it. And I, you know, I'm not saying that it's all about identity, but it is about experience. If you have an experience with working, say, with national defense, if you have an experience working in NATO, and if on top of that you have an experience of working somehow within an EU framework, you get a fairly holistic view. And what we need to stop doing is this sort of binary thinking that it's only about national defense, it's only about NATO, or it's only about the EU. No, actually, it's about all of these three. And deterrence is as much about credibility as it is about Indeed. communication. Because, you know, if you don't have the credible military forces, it's very difficult to speak that up and make it into a deterrence. But I do think that NATO right now, I mean, is doing exactly the opposite of what Putin wanted. It is going back to its original mission from 1949 to work as a deterrence against Russia. And it's doing that actually by hiking up its capacity uh, materially, financially, and in general by operability. Um, And still, I would argue that uh, being a member of the alliance is the strongest deterrence that we can have. Thank you. Colleagues, it makes it, it's kind of, uh, you've, you've been really refreshing, and I say that in the, in the nicest way, um, in that, you know, you've been the Prime Minister, you've been in various portfolios in, you know, trade and as well as foreign relations, and you've been out and you've come back in. And it shows that there's a kind of different kind of um, framing of these issues, but being able to think very differently in a more, let's say, policy coherent way and to be bold about it. So thank you very much. For the, we all, wish you well. Uh, we wish you, you well. Thank you. You should all take a break and go to the European University Institute in Florence. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so colleagues, before I let this man go, uh, where are the photographers, right? Yeah, I have to give him this report because this is our 10 policy choices that we've created for the new mandate. And you'll be pleased that in there, there's a policy choice around a kind of a whole of society, whole of economy approach to defense, which is very much in line with your thinking. So can you just capture that? Thank you. We give that to you. Um, Because we know we like pictures. So commercial break. Absolutely. A commercial break. And also, uh, those of you who've missed it, uh, don't forget, we have our Ukraine initiative that we launched last year. Um, um, we recently brought out a report on Russia, uh, i.e. the three potential outcomes of a victory, uh, what that might mean. But most importantly, mark the date, 28th of May, where we will have our Ukraine Security Forum. And one of the conversations we're going to have is that how do you rant, ratchet up the public diplomacy effort? But that point, which I think is one of your moonshots, actually, which I like the way you framed it, is that the money generator. How do you pool resources plus also frozen assets or seized assets and create some sort of special purpose vehicle? Uh, to do good across Europe but over the long term, not just in response to this crisis. So if you're interested in that, please sign up and look at our website. Thank you all. This is as much about you being here uh, as him being here. Yeah. So I thank you all for being present and turning up and take care. And as you said, have a break and go out in the lovely sunshine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.